going to be in First Kings chapter 9. Speaking of homes, okay. <laughs> speaking of homes, this week, as Cynthia said, as Jonathan prayed for, is Thanksgiving week. And for many of us, we will be on the road. We will be traveling, going back home, okay? Many of us will be going back home. And some will be doing this out of obligation, <laughs> But some of us will be doing this out of anticipation. Anticipation of being home again and being around family again and going back uh, to uh, nostalgia as it was when we were growing up. Going back to that place that we call home. Now, I know and understand that all of us don't feel the same way about home. All of us don't feel the same way about going home. For some of us, we'd rather not do that. You know, when you were growing up, you couldn't wait to get out. You couldn't wait to leave. But then there are those of us that we really can't wait to get back. We really can't wait to get back home. Because as children growing up, home was the place that we wanted to be. As, as we were children growing up, home was the place we wanted to be. Why? Because that's where we were comforted. That's where we were loved and received and accepted. That's where we were protected and provided for. That's where our security was, in other words. Our security was in home. It wasn't until we started to grow up a little bit. <laughs> it wasn't until we started to become more independent that we began to appreciate home less. You know, once you started getting 14, 15, 16, you started telling your parents, I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> I can't wait till I can be on my own and, and do my own thing. And we began to appreciate home far less as we began to grow up and become independent more. Well, while this should be the case with our physical home, you should come to a place where you're tired of your home. Okay? You should come to a place where it starts to be uncomfortable, where it's time to leave the nest. Because just like the people of Israel did, uh, or the people of God did, where they tried to have one city and one tower, they were going to stay in one central location, that wasn't what God called them to do. He said, no, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And so we are not to stay at home. We are supposed to leave the nest. We are supposed to go out and venture out and start families of our own in different towns and different cities and different states so that we may take this gospel message in the light of the world or light that God has for us to the world. Okay? So even though that may be the case with our physical home, that we are supposed to grow up, we are supposed to become independent, we are supposed to leave, that is never supposed to be the case with our spiritual home. That is never supposed to be the case with your spiritual home. You are never supposed to become so independent where you began to depreciate home. That is your spiritual home. But I believe we would uh, need to be like Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> who couldn't wait to get back, who did all that she could to get back, because for her, there was no place like home. There was no place like home. So in our text, as we get into our scripture today, in our text, Solomon is going to be visited once again by God. Solomon is going to get a second holy visitation from God. God is going to appear to him a second time. If you remember the first time God came to Solomon, it was for the reason of handing him a blank check. He goes to Solomon and he says, Solomon, ask of me. I will give you whatever you want. He gives Solomon a blank check. And Solomon says, Lord, you have placed me in the place of my father to govern your people. And so give me a discerning heart. Give me a heart filled with wisdom that I may know how to govern your people. God says, well, because you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you what you want. I'm going to give you what you asked for. But because you asked for wisdom, I'm even going to give you what you didn't ask for. Riches and fame and, and fortune. I'm going to give that to you because you sought me, you sought the kingdom first. So that was the first holy visitation that Solomon receives from the Lord. But now that Solomon has finished building the building, now that Solomon has finished building the tabernacle, building the temple, building the house or the home of God on earth, he is now going to be visited by God again, 
And this time, the purpose of God coming to visit Solomon again is to let him know that there's no place like home. To let him, I, I'm grateful, Solomon, that you have built me this home, but I have come to you today to let you know that there is no place like home. And so we've entitled this particular message today, No Place Like Home. First Kings chapter 9, starting in verse 1, it reads as follows. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gideon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. If you were here last week, you know and understand exactly what God is saying here. We talked about God's triangle. After Solomon built the temple of God, he said, Lord, may this temple be that which connects you and I. So whenever we are in doubt, whenever we're in fear, whenever we have sin, whenever the enemy comes against us, whenever we're held captive, whatever the need may be, when you shut the heavens and there's no rain, when the devourer has come and taken all that we have, whatever situation we find ourselves in, may we always turn to this temple. And when we turn to the temple, may you hear in heaven and give us exactly what we need. That was God's triangle. And so God simply comes to Solomon first and says, Solomon, I heard your prayer. I heard what you said, and I've come to let you know that what you pray for is exactly what's going to happen. My eyes and my heart will perpetually be on this temple, on this house, on this home that you have built for me. Right? But at the same time, God is now going to admonish Solomon to stay home. Okay? He is now going to admonish Solomon that he needs to stay home. In verse 4. In verse 4 it says, Now if you walk before me as your father David walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments. In other words, If you appreciate home, Solomon, if you appreciate home, then this is what's going to happen. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So God says to Solomon, Solomon, if you appreciate home enough to stay faithful to home, then you will be able to receive the benefits of home. Okay? If you appreciate home enough to stay faithful to home, then you will enjoy the benefits of home. But now then God is going to warn him of the irony of independence. He's going to warn him of the irony of independence. In verse 6 he says, But if you or your sons at all turn from following me, Turn from this temple. Turn from this home. You do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but you go and you serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them, and this house which I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And as for this house which is exalted, Everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, Why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshipped them and served them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this calamity upon them. You see, the irony about independence is this. That which we thought would make us happy is bringing nothing but misery. That's the irony of independence. When you were growing up, you couldn't wait to grow up, right? (laughs) 
You couldn't wait to be independent. You couldn't wait to get out of your parents' house and do what you want and come and go as you please and not have to answer to anybody. But then all of a sudden you realize, wait a minute, I gotta now get a job. <laughs> I, I gotta find an apartment. I gotta pay my bills. I got I gotta so in other words, it wasn't all what it we thought it was going to be. When we decided to leave home and venture off on our own because we wanted to be independent, we wanted to be our own man or our own woman, we didn't want to answer anybody, we wanted to come and go as we pleased, we thought that that would bring us happiness, but the irony is that it just brought misery because we left home before it was time. Well, if that is true, physically speaking, in our physical homes, even our physical family, how much more then is it true when we decide to leave our spiritual homes? When we decide to turn our back on the temple of God? When we decide to turn our back on the presence of God that we may go out and begin to worship other gods? You know, Israel has this bad. Israel has this bad because they continue to do this time and time and time again. They would be with God, but in the comfort and the prosperity of being with God, they then turn their back on God. And they begin to worship all these other gods, these pagan gods. And as a result of that, they were uh, uh, defeated by their enemies. They were held captive by their enemies. And so they would cry out to God again. They would turn back to him. God will come to their rescue, bring them in again. And then the uh, process would just repeat all over again. And in the same way, when that would happen, God would say, you have turned away from your true God to worship these other gods. That even though they have eyes, they cannot see. Even though they have ears, they cannot hear you when you cry out. Even though they have mouths, they cannot speak or talk to you. Even though they have legs, they cannot move. Even though they have arms, they cannot stay. Why? Because there were gods of wood and gods of stone that they were turning to. And even though the gods that we turn to today are not made of wood and stone, there are gods nonetheless. There are idols in our lives nonetheless because the Bible says you are a slave to whomever you obey. Whoever it is that you obey... That has become your master. That has become your God, whether it's the God of pleasure, the God of money, the God of power, whatever it is, when you forsake the one true God and begin to worship the gods of this world, you have just left home. You have left home and you have forsaken what God has for you. Let those gods who you now turn to, the Bible says, save you. Let those gods that you have now turned to, the Bible says, rescue you. Let those gods that you have now turned to heal you, protect you, provide for you. See, it's not that God is the cause of all this. He's not the cause of calamity. It's that when we left home, we severed our access to God. When we decided to leave home, we severed our access to the resources of God. So all that God has for us when we decided to forsake Him and turn from the temple and go and do our own thing and become independent of God, it's not that God brought the calamity, it's that we severed our access to the resources we need. It's not like people living in this country who don't like America. And they like to talk about America and they like to protest against America, and they like to turn their back on the American flag whenever the national anthem is is being played, but they are doing that while they are enjoying the benefits of America. And that's something I never understood. (laughs) You want to turn your back on the flag by which people die to give you that right to even do so. You want to talk about how bad America is, but yet you want to stay here and continue to receive the benefits of America. (laughs) Why don't you then leave America? If America is that bad, if you don't like America that much, why don't you leave then America and go somewhere else? Why don't you try turning your back on the Chinese flag? (laughs) Why don't you try going and turning your back on the North Korean flag and see what happens to you, okay? (laughs) So how is it that we can be in America turn our back on America, but still expect to receive the benefits of America. 
And that's the same attitude, that's the same mentality that we take to the kingdom. We want to turn our back on God. We don't want to follow his ways, his will, his words, or his commands. We want to be independent of God, but yet we still want God to bless us. We still want to receive the benefit of the kingdom, even though we have turned our back on the kingdom. God says, no, it doesn't work that way. When you forsake me, when you turn your back toward, away from this temple, away from me, then you are severing your access to all the resources that I have for you in the kingdom. You see, what God is going to do, or what God has already done, it is not contingent on you and I. What God is going to do or what God has already done is not based on you and I. God says whenever we are faithless, He is going to be faithless. No, it says He's going to be even faithful. Whenever we are faithless, He will remain faithful. Why? Because He cannot deny Himself. He cannot deny who He is. And if He said it, it shall happen. It shall come to pass. Remember, He came into a unilateral covenant with Abraham and his descendants. He says, this is what I am going to do. So, Nothing that we do or don't do is going to determine what God is going to do or not do. God is going to do what he said he's going to do. God is going to do what he wants to do. However, our ability to enjoy what God has already done is based on us. What God has done, if we are going to enjoy what God has done, that will be based on us. Kind of like those who are in prison right now. They, they live in uh, the greatest country in the, in, the, in the face of the earth. And they're here, but they're in prison because they committed crime. Well, we know that this is the greatest country on earth because this is the land of the free. And this is the land of opportunity. And that's why people from all over the world are doing whatever they can to get here. Because it's the land of the free and the land of opportunity. But the people who are in prison, can they now stay in prison? Oh, this isn't the land of the free. This isn't the land of opportunity. No, no. They didn't change America. What they changed was their enjoyment of America. They changed their enjoyment of the land of the free. They, they changed their enjoyment of receiving the benefit of this being a land of opportunity. But they did not change the fact that America is still America. And in the same way, you are not going to change who God is. You're not going to change what God does. What you're going to change is your enjoyment of it. This is what God wants you to know when he says, stay home. And so he goes to Solomon simply and he says, Solomon, I want you to stay home. Solomon, I want you to know and understand that there's no place like home. Solomon, I do not want you to forsake this home. Don't forsake this temple. Don't forsake your God. Stay home that it may be well with you. As a matter of fact, it's the warning that he gives throughout in Scripture in the entire Bible. If you remember, he told Adam and Eve that of every tree in my garden you may freely eat from. I've given you this garden, and you may freely eat from every tree that is in this garden. So he gave them the benefits of being home, the benefits of staying home. But then he gives them the same warning. He says, make sure you stay home. What is that? What was that commandment to stay home? Well, when he gave the trees, it wasn't just one tree there. It was two trees in the midst of the garden. There was a tree of life, and then there was the tree that produced death. And he simply says, be careful how you choose. Be careful how you choose. Either it's the tree of life or it's the tree of death. He told Israel the same thing through Joshua. He said, through Joshua, choose this day who you will serve. If you think it's evil or wicked to serve the Lord and you want to serve Baal, go serve Baal. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you have to choose. You must make that decision, that choice, whether to stay with the Lord, stay home, or to forsake Him. In Deuteronomy 30, he said it again. I have set before you today life and death, blessings and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Throughout Scripture, he gives this warning, and now he is coming to Solomon with the same warning. Solomon, choose life. So, for the next two weeks, this is what we get to do. We get to see what Solomon is going to do. <laughs> We get to see what Solomon is going to do. Now that God has come to him and revealed himself to him and given him this warning, for the next two weeks we get to see what Solomon is going to do. Is he going to stay home? 
Is he going to remain faithful to the temple, remain faithful to serving God and him alone? Or is he going to turn and forsake his God and begin to worship other gods? That's what we get to see in the next two weeks. But let me close with a parable that Jesus gives to illustrate this point that he is making to Solomon. Jesus gave a parable about the prodigal son. He gave a a parable about the prodigal son. The prodigal son was the younger son who was tired of being at home. He was tired of living under his dad's roof, under his dad's rules. And so he goes to his dad one day and he says, "Uh, Father, I want to leave. I want to go. And so I'm asking you to give me my inheritance now. See, it's funny, he wanted to leave, but he needed some money to leave. <laughs> he wanted to get away from his father, but he wanted his father to, to give him the money to do so. But at any rate, he says, Father, it's mine anyway. You're going to give it to me eventually. Anyway, whenever you die, I'm going to get what portion belongs to me. So give me my portion now. Give me my inheritance now so I can get out of here. I don't want to be in this house anymore. I don't want to be under your rules anymore. I don't want to uh, be accountable to you anymore. I want to come and go as I please and do my own thing. So give me my inheritance so I can go. So the father does that. The father gives his son his inheritance. And the son, he goes out, and the Bible says he begins to squander his inheritance. He begins to waste it on prodigal or sinful living. And he was having a good time doing it. Because the Bible even says that, yes, there is pleasure in sin. Do you know the Bible does say that? (laughs) There is pleasure in sin. But if you keep reading, you will read that it says, but it's only for a season. There is pleasure in sin, but it is only for a season. And it came time where that season, where it was pleasurable, what this guy was doing, came to an end. It came to a time where his money ran out and his friends left him. When he could no longer buy rounds for everybody, his friends were nowhere to be found any longer. So he found himself penniless. He found himself friendless. He found himself all alone. And so now he had to go out and find a job. Now, he didn't have to work when he was at home. He worked for his father. He received what his father had for him. But now that he's on his own, now that the money's run dry, the friends have gone and forsaken him, he now has to get a job. And the only job he can get is a job that he would never want because he was a Jewish man, and that was taking care of sheep. I'm sorry, taking care of pigs, taking care of swine. Taking care of swine, that was something that, a Jewish man would have never done why? Because the swine, the pig, was an unclean animal. But that's the only thing that he could find to do, and he was there, and guess what? While he was working this job, it still wasn't enough. Even though he had found this job, it still wasn't enough because the Bible says that he was still hungry. He was still hungry, and the Bible says he would have gladly ate what the pigs were eating, but nobody gave him anything. So he is in this pig pen. He's doing what he never thought he would do. He is penniless. He is friendless. But all of a sudden, he has an epiphany. (laughs) All of a sudden, it hits him. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. How many of my father's hired help My father's servants are living better than I am right now. I mean, how many? I mean, they got a nice place to to lay their head. They got a a warm or hot plate of food. They are living better than I am. They are hired help. They are servants. I am a son, and they're living better than me right now. What he began to do is he began to think about home. And he began to think, there's no place like home. There is no place. I, now, I thought that I was going to go out and, and find something that I didn't have at home, something I was needing, something I was missing. But now that I've done that, I've come to the realization that there is no place like home. What I need to do is I need to go back to my father. And I know that I have sinned. I know that I forsook him. I know that I turned away from him. But I'm going to ask him if he can just make me like one of his servants. I'm not worthy to be called his son because of what I've done, but if he can just make me like one of his servants, if he can make me like a hired help, at least I'd be better off there as a servant than I'm here in the pig pen. 
And so he does that. He turns. He turns back toward home. He turns back toward his father. And he begins to go back home. And the Bible says that his father receives him. His father embraces him. His father restores him, not as a servant, but as a son. He is able to now come back to what he left and abandoned. But that doesn't have to be the case with us. We don't have to leave God to understand how good God is. We don't have to go out into the world and experience all the heartache of what the world has to know that our God is good. To know that, no, there's nothing in this world, there's nothing in this life that is like our God. There's nothing that we are missing out on because we have now given our life to Jesus Christ and we're living wholeheartedly for Him. We don't have to venture away from God to receive the knowledge that there's no place like home. So may we do that. May we make it up in our minds this very day that we are going to remain home, that we're going to remain faithful to God and faithful to His work and faithful to the kingdom of God in all the way that He has commanded us to do that. And not to get uh, uh, blindsided by the bling and bling and all the things of this world that try and draw us away from our Heavenly Father and home. So, we want to leave you with that. Maybe you're here today, and you have never given your life to Christ. You can't go home because you've never been home. You've never been home. You've never given your life to, to Jesus Christ. The only way that we can be home, the Bible says, is that we be born into it. You must be born into this home. And so, just like we were born the first time in our physical way, the Bible says we must be born again. We must be born again, this time, of the Spirit of God. And that is by believing on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who left the splendors of heaven, who came to this world to die in our place, who became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him and through Him. It is by believing in Him, trusting Him, giving your life to Him, that you become a son or a daughter of God, and you are now brought into the home, brought into the family, brought into the kingdom of God. So if you've never done that, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, repented of your sin, that is to turn from the ways of this world, the ways of the kingdom of darkness, and to Jesus Christ across in his kingdom, do that today. Give your life to Jesus Christ today that you may be in the home of God. Well, there's another plea. Maybe you are here today and you are saved. You are a believer. You are a Christian. You are a blood-bought, spirit-filled on your way to heaven. But you have contemplated leaving. You have began to look at the things of this world and your desire for the things of this world have become more than your desire for the things of God. And you're just like that prodigal son. You, you want to venture off and you want to see what the world has to offer. Can I give you the same warning that God gave Solomon? Stay home. <laughs> know that there's no place like home. Know that there's nothing in this world that compares to what God has for you. Stay home. So that is my plea to you. If you are a Christian, if you are already at home, stay there. <laughs> then I have one more plea. Maybe you were a Christian. You gave your life to Jesus Christ at one time, but you walked away from Him. And maybe God has brought you to this service today to let you know you can always come home. You can always come home. He's not there to condemn you. He's not there to beat you up. He is there to receive you. But he's waiting for you. God is a gentleman. He knocks at the door and he waits for you to open it. He stands at the uh, gate of his kingdom and he waits for you to come. He waits for you to make the decision that I'm going to turn and start coming to Jesus Christ. So if you walked away from the Lord in any way and you want to come back home because you now realize there's no place like home and do that at this time as well. We're going to have our elders and wives stand at the cross. We're going to Worship God one more time in song. And we're going to ask that you uh, uh, just get along with God as He begins to minister to your heart and life. And whatever decision that He calls you to make, whether it's to give your life to Him for the very first time, to remain faithful to Him and His kingdom, or to come back home, then we pray you would do that. Amen? Let us pray. Precious Lord, thank you again for blessing us with this day in your presence. And thank you, God, for giving us the realization, the revelation, God, that there is no place like home. We thank you, God, that you've given us this warning, this uh, admonishment, God, 
that we may know and understand that there is nothing outside of you that we need. Nothing outside of you that we desire. For it is all in you, God. And we ask, Lord, for every person who is here, that as you begin to minister to their hearts and lives by your spirit and your spoken word, that we would all here make the decision to either give our lives to you, that we may be in your home, to remain faithful to the home, or to come back home. I pray, God, as we do this, Lord, that you will hear our cry, our petition, and you will come to our rescue. For we don't pray to a God who has ears but cannot hear. We don't pray to a false God, a God of wood and a God of stone. No, we pray to the living God who's omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. You are here with us today. So as we cry out to you today and make a point in our hearts and minds today that we're going to love you with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, and with all of our strength. We pray, God, you will hear it and be glorified through the life you've given us. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Leave your hands of the Holy Spirit at this time. Be blessed.